We're in Luke chapter 10, if you would turn there with me this morning. Luke 10, and I'll be reading beginning in verse 25. Luke 10, beginning in verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Pray with me, would you please? Father, we thank you for this, your word, inherently given, carefully planned, and for our benefit. And Lord, as we look at this passage today, I pray that you will, in fact, enlighten our understanding cause us to see you in a whole new way. I pray, Father, that we would understand, perhaps as we never have before, what it is you are saying here. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is um, one of the most familiar parables in the Bible, also one of the most misinterpreted. Most of you have probably heard this taught and preached on, that the point of this passage is that we should love everybody and that's the message, and that is a subtext here, but it's not the main message. It's not the main message of this passage. We'll look at that in a couple of weeks, but that's not the main message. The main message here is this. It is intended to show the absolute impossibility of us saving ourselves. It is God's grace and not our goodness that saves us. I think there's, is there a movie Dumb and Dumber out now? You all know Dumb and Dumber, right? Dumb was out in the parking lot with Dumber one day. He's standing there looking a little perplexed, and he's got a, he's got a coat hanger in his, in his hand, and he says, I just, I can't get the, I can't get the locks to this car to come up. And Dummer looks at him and says, well, man, you better hurry up because it's starting to rain and the top is still down. <laughs> Beloved, there's a point. The point is this. That's how dumb it is to do what most of the world is doing, which is to stand around and say, there's got to be some way that I can earn my way to heaven when grace has the top down the whole time. People in Jesus' time thought obeying the law was their means of salvation. Jesus came along and said, no. It's by believing in me and repenting of your sins. And so many thought he was destroying the law. They thought he was putting it aside. Jesus himself disavowed that notion when he said in, in Matthew 5, 17, words that you're familiar with, do not think that I have come 
to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Very important wording, but to fulfill them. That's why he came. But the Pharisees and the religious elite have this all backwards. They have misunderstood and misinterpreted the purpose of the law. They teach that the law is a means of salvation, not a tool to teach us that we need salvation. And there's a huge difference there. They live in the illusion that they can enter the kingdom of God, that they can earn heaven, that they can earn favor with God by keeping the law at least as defined by them. But you can imagine this left everyone in a constant state of fear. Have I been good enough? Have I done enough? What more should I have to do? Where do I really stand right now? So Jesus uses a question from a lawyer to expose, to expose really the, the dreadful idea that we're not sinful and that somehow we can earn our own way. Now, this guy is not a lawyer in the sense we might think. He's he's a lawyer in the sense that he's an expert in the Mosaic law and, and all the tradition that had been built up around the Mosaic law by the time of Christ. He believes that you get eternal life by keeping the law, and he believes that he can do that. He knows that Jesus has been teaching, that you need to repent, and that to have eternal life, you can have it now by simply accepting him as your savior. And he's determined to show that in teaching like that, Jesus is absolutely in violation of the law. Instead, the absolute opposite happens here. Jesus shows this man that Jesus is far more, has a far higher view of the law, cares far more about the law than this man does, and he does it in an ingenious fashion. As usual, Jesus is three steps ahead, right? And so he is here. The key to interpreting this passage, and many like it in the Bible, by the way, the key to interpreting this passage is to understand that Jesus is going to play along with the lawyer. He's going to play along with the assumption that you can somehow be saved by keeping the law. But his idea is to show this man, let's go down that path, and when we get to the end, let's see where we are. He's basically saying, okay, Mr. Lawyer, let's assume your assumption that you can save yourself by keeping the law. Let's go down that road. Let's see where we end up. And it turns out they don't end up very well. This parable is given to illustrate the truth of Galatians 3. Let me just read it for you. There's a wonderful passage in Galatians 3, verses 10 and 11, where Paul said this. He said, For all who rely on works of the law. In other words, anybody who thinks they're saved by doing good, anybody who thinks it's that, that they're okay because they're better than the next guy, anybody who is counting in any way on good works to get them to heaven, All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified by God, by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. In a nutshell, that's exactly what Jesus is teaching in this passage. He's trying to draw this man to faith. He's trying to get him to see that he falls far short of the perfection that's really demanded. So let's look at how he does that in this passage. First of all, what the law requires. What is it that the law requires? If we want to be saved by keeping the law, if that's how we think, we will favor, get, get ourselves into favor with God. What does it take? Verse 28, sorry, verse 25. Behold, a lawyer stood up to him, stood up to put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the fact that he's putting him to the test tells us that that he's not being very honest here in the first place, but the word behold ties this right back to the 
previous section where the 72 have come back and they've been rejoicing in all the things that happened when they went out, remember that? And their message had been repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. And for this lawyer, there wasn't nearly enough law in that message. And so he's gonna test Jesus. He's gonna test Jesus. It's always been a fatal mistake and it's a fatal mistake here as well assuming that Jesus will disavow the law. That's what his assumption is. So he baits his trap. Teacher, what must I, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do to be right with God? That's a great question, isn't it? I wish everybody was asking that question. I hope you're asking that question. So many people go through life without ever really facing that question. God has brought you here this morning to face that question, perhaps for the first time. I don't know. There's no greater question in life to ever ask, but notice how this man phrases it. He says, what shall I do? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the question itself doesn't make sense because if you inherit something, you don't do anything to inherit, right? You just be. But he's looking for something to do, and the word, that the the grammar that he uses here is instructive because Jesus is gonna change it around a little bit in a moment, but he says, what must I do? It's an aorist, Greek aorist tense, which means a point in time action. He's looking for the one big thing. He's been trying to keep the law all of his life, but he's still not sure. So he wants to know, well, what else? What's the one thing I must do to win favor with God? He's a lawyer, he knows the law, but he's totally misinterpreted its meaning. From his perspective, the law is saying, do this, do that, and do the other thing, and then you're going to be okay. And he's wondering if he's missed anything. But the question is just a setup in this case. It's just a setup. He's expecting that when he says, what must I do? Jesus is going to say, wait a minute, do? You must, you must do nothing. You must repent your sins and, and, and accept me as your Savior. That's what you must do. You must believe in me and repent. There's nothing else to do. That's what he expected. And then he could turn around and see, say to the people, see, this guy doesn't respect the law at all. He doesn't believe in the law. He doesn't revere the law. He can't be of God because he doesn't obey the law of God. He doesn't hold the law of God in reverence. That's what he thought would happened. That's what he expected. It's not quite what he got, right? He got a question. Jesus often does that. It's a good thing to remember when you're thinking about how do you talk to people who maybe don't know the Lord instead of challenging them. Sometimes it's good to ask a lot of questions, and Jesus did that a lot. He says to him here, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He's he's returning serve. He's saying, you want to know What you must do to inherit eternal life? Well, you're the lawyer. You're the expert on the law here. How do you, what's your take? What do you think? So the guy finds himself unexpectedly with the ball back in his court. But he's kind of had a lifetime of preparation. Doesn't take him but a minute to think this over and decide, here's the way I'll answer. And he quotes Deuteronomy 6. And in verse 27, he says it this way. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That's Moses' summary of the law given in Deuteronomy 6. Love God with all your heart covers the first four of the Ten Commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself covers the last six of the Ten Commandments. So in this two-fold emphasis, there is basically the coverage of the whole law. And so he's basically saying, Jesus is saying to him, what do you think? And the guy says, well, just keep the law. So Jesus stops him in his tracks and says, no, 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 that's not right. Believe in me, right? Is that that, that what Jesus does? Not what he does, is it? In fact, surprisingly, Jesus agrees with him. Jesus agrees with him. But remember, beloved, Jesus is accepting for argument's sake, the premise that this man has that you can be saved by keeping the law. And so Jesus responds in verse 28 and says, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Only Jesus is starting to turn the screws here already because remember I told you the lawyer asked the question, what must I do? Single 
point in time action, Jesus says, do this, present tense verb, do this all the time to all people, every way, every circumstance, do this and you will live. If you want to live by the law, this is all you have to do. Love God and love your neighbor all the time. It's not a one-time thing. It's an all-the-time thing. If that is the road you want to go down. Now, brings up another issue. How fully does the law require this? How fully does the law require this? Because here's Jesus having given this answer, and now the lawyer who thought he was going to put Jesus in a box is kind of sitting there with egg on his face, right? He's asked Jesus, what must I do? And Jesus got him to answer his own question, and then Jesus affirmed that his answer is correct. So the lawyer's now standing there, and basically the whole crowd's looking at him saying, why did you ask that question? Looks like Jesus agrees with you, you agree with you, everybody is good here, right? And so the guy immediately needs to justify himself. That's why we read in verse 29, it says, but he desiring to justify himself said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? So to justify his first question, he now asks the second. Jesus has said, do this and live. So the lawyer says, okay, let's talk about this. Do this and live. What exactly does do this mean? Love your neighbor, so who's my neighbor? In other words, when you're embarrassed, what's the best thing to do? Ask a confusing question, right? Ask a theological question. And so that's what he's doing here. He's just trying to add confusion to the mix. But there's one other thing you should know. In the tradition, not in the law, but in the tradition of the Pharisees that had built up around the law, there was a statement. And understand that the Pharisees considered the tradition that had built up around the law at least the equal of the law. In fact, most of them considered those traditions more important than the law of God. And the tradition that had built up around the law that said, love your neighbor, was this. In the Pharisaic writings, they had interpreted this to mean love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Remember, we've come across that before. That's what they believed. That was high on their list. And so you see the point right away. There's some nebulous line in the sand somewhere, right, where you got to love all the people on this side, but you can hate all the people on this side. I suppose they would say there's some middle ground, but that's the basic idea. And so This lawyer figures this is a good thing to throw out and see what Jesus has to say about that. He says, let's talk about that. What does it mean to do? Let's have a theological discussion here. So what does Jesus do? What what the guy is really asking is, how fully do I have to obey the law? And Jesus could have said, well, you have to obey it fully, but he didn't. He gives him a story. He gives him a story. And in this story, Jesus talks about a man, presumed to be a Jewish man, who's going from Jerusalem down to Jericho. It was a very dangerous road in those days. If you took a bus on that road today, as we did one hot day in May, and looked at the barrenness of all the surroundings and the rocks that are up on the hillsides and the caves that are back there and a a few sparse settlements here and there, you would see why even today you would not want to walk that road. It's a dangerous road. So Jesus said this guy is walking from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he is attacked, sure enough, by thieves. They rob him, they beat him within an inch of his life, and leave him for dead. Now both a Jewish priest and a Jewish Levite, a temple helper, both walk by and essentially ignore him. They're too busy, too self-important. Some have suggested they didn't want to, they they feared perhaps touching a dead body, that they were going to um, involve themselves in ceremonial uncleanliness by doing that, and so they just walked right on by. It doesn't really matter. The point is, they left someone who was in great need behind without any help. Then along comes a despised Samaritan. A Samaritan, the absolute worst 
person a Jewish people could think of, a Jewish person could think of, right? A Samaritan, a half-breed. Those half-breeds that live up there just north of where they lived. A person that it was legal to hate. In fact, it was almost an obligation to hate that person. The lowly Samaritan comes along, and what does he do? He shows compassion. He stops at the risk of his own life. He takes his own, uh, his own supplies and and helps this man as best he can. He gets him on his donkey. He takes him to an inn where he can get further help. He pays for his housing and says, I'll pay for more if there's more required when I come back. He does everything that's within his power to help this man at his own expense. That's the story that Jesus tells. And then he asks a question in verse 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. You talk about being in a corner. This guy is in a corner now, like he's never seen before. Because what's he going to answer? He can't say the priest and the Levite were a neighbor to that man, can he? It's not possible. The only thing that's left is for him to do what he does, which is to admit the one who showed him mercy. Bingo, right again? You're right. It was the Samaritan who showed compassion. And so Jesus says, good, you, go and do, present tense all the time, likewise. And with that one story, do you see what he did? He took that nebulous line that existed in the Pharisees' theology and totally obliterated it. There is no line There is no these you can love and these you can hate. There's nothing like that. And in this story, it's the hated Samaritan who has shown compassion. And so Jesus is showing him, you want eternal life by keeping the law? This is where you have to go. You have to do what this Samaritan did. Who is your neighbor? Wrong question. The question is, to whom must you be a neighbor? And the answer is, everybody, all the time, in every circumstance, no matter what. That's what the law requires. There's no loophole. There's no way out. The demand is total obedience. That's what Jesus is showing him. Beloved, there's something in common with everybody who wants to be saved by keeping the law. Everybody who, which includes most of our neighbors, right? Everybody who thinks that they can somehow be good enough. And the question is this, how much is enough? How how good do I have to be to be good enough? And why is that the question? That's the question because we all know that we're not perfect, right? We all know that. Nobody has to come along to me and prove to me that I'm not perfect. Nobody has to come along and prove to you that you're not perfect. You know that. I know that. This lawyer knew that. So the question is, how much is enough? Am I making it? And Jesus is answering by saying enough is perfection. It's the same thing James says when he says in James 2.10, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point is what? He's accountable for the whole thing. So you're saying you just do a little thing and it's like you disobeyed the whole law? Exactly. Say, how can that be fair? Let me tell you how that can be fair and and how that can be right. It's because the law is not a code. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. I know it takes that character, but that's not what it is at its core. What is the law at its core? It's a description of the character and the person of God. That's what the law is. And every sin is a violation of the character of God. And you can't just like violate a little finger here and everything else is over. You know, it's like going 70 and a 55. That's a violation of a list, right? 
It doesn't hurt anybody unless you happen to run into them. You come into my home and I have a rule. You know, the rule says, if you're going to, if you're going to stay overnight with me, the rule is you have to do the evening dishes. And you're there for a couple of nights and you do the evening dishes. And the third night you're busy and you don't do the dishes. You have violated the list, right? But that's different than if you come into my living room and point a gun at me and rob me and then beat me and leave me for dead. Now you haven't just violated a list of do's and don'ts. You have violated my person. And that's what, that's what the law is, the the law is a description of the person of God, and that's why every sin is a violation of the person of God. It's not just violating a list of do's and don'ts. It's a violation of God, and even one violation condemns us in the eyes of God. Listen, why? Because, because when you violate God, you've, you've violated an infinite person. And one violation of an infinite God, and you've created an infinite problem. That's why, that's why James says, if you, if, you, if you fail even in one point of the law, you're accountable for the whole thing. Now where are we? In big trouble, right? I always like the story, I think I've told it before, I don't know, but you know, lifelong agnostic, W.C. Fields. Somebody found him, at least this is the story, they, they discovered him reading a Bible as he's on his deathbed, basically, right? And somebody asked him, why are you reading the Bible? He said, I'm looking for a loophole. I don't know whether he was serious. I don't even know if he really said it. Was he serious? Was he, was he laughing? I don't know. If he was actually reading the Bible, I'm guessing he was serious. There are no loopholes. If you want to be saved by keeping the law, the demand is absolute perfection. Being better than somebody else doesn't cut it. So that brings us to the third point, right? The impossibility of the law's demands. This clearly leaves all of us on the outside looking in, doesn't it? Jesus doesn't tell this man this parable to show him how to be saved. He simply tells it to him to show him that he needs to be saved that what Jesus had been preaching all along about repentance and believing in him is the right thing. That's what the law was for. This is the right use of the law. He's showing it's impossible to be saved by being good. Why? Because none of us are good, not to the level the law requires. He couldn't, and we can't claim that we can keep the law of God even a little bit. The law says you got to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. Did you do that even this morning? Really? God was foremost in everything you did? The law says you must love your neighbor as yourself, even your enemy neighbors. How are you doing with that one? Let's forget that one. Let me ask you this. How are you doing about your spouse neighbor? How's that one going? You always put your spouse first every time, always thinking of him or her ahead of your own thoughts and your own desires and your own way. You, you got that one down, right? Don't lie to me. <laughs> We're not perfect. We're not even close. We're not in the ballpark. That's what Jesus is trying to teach here. This man is showing this man by his own admission that he's a sinner who needs to be saved by grace. He's trapped him. He says, what, which of the three do you think proved to be a neighbor? The man says, the one who showed mercy. Notice he doesn't say the Samaritan. Why? You want to acknowledge that that guy's a Samaritan. He just says, well, yeah, okay, the guy that showed mercy. Right. The Samaritan. Why wouldn't he say Samaritan? Because that's what condemned him. When Jesus says to him now in the last verse, go and do likewise, he knows he can't do that. He is guilty as sin. He knows that he has hated every Samaritan he ever met. That's why Galatians says, if you want to keep, if you want to be saved by keeping the law, it, it, it's, it, did you notice the wording? It says, cursed is everyone. It, in other words, you start out cursed. You don't start out with a chance. You start out already done for. Because you already have hatred in your heart. You already 
have evil in your heart. You already have wickedness in your heart. You can't be saved by keeping the law. You've already violated the law. Jesus' story is given to show this man that there was no possibility that he could do this. Jesus didn't destroy the law. He used the law for its intended purpose. Jesus is showing this man, listen, you think I don't revere the law? I revere the law much more than you do. I, I hold the law in much higher regard than you do. You think you can keep the law. I know you can't. And now I've shown you that you can't. Who holds the law in higher regard now? See, the only way the lawyer, the only way the lawyer could even pretend that he could keep the law was by what? Was by diminishing the law, by making it less. I used to work with police departments all around the country. And over the many years that I worked with those, I found that something happened. Most of them, because of budget cutbacks and various things, had to begin to, they had to begin to seek employees, seek law enforcement officers who couldn't meet the standards that they had at the beginning. And so virtually every department that I knew of had to lower the standards over time so that people could pass the test and become police officers. Now, this is not an anti-police officer diatribe like we're seeing going around the country. I'm in their corner, 100%. But the point is, the standard had to be lowered so that somebody who wouldn't have qualified before could meet it. And that's the only way the lawyer could meet the law of God is because he had come up with his own means, he and all the people that were surrounding him, their own interpretations, their own tradition that they held in higher regard of the law, and they gradually brought the law down to a, to a point where they could say, well, I, theoretically, I meet this law. They didn't meet the real law of God at all. They were like the, the doctor who walks into a, to a room, right, and... and Outside the room, there's a, there's a coffin sitting, and he's so busy with his, he's so busy with his charts, he doesn't see it, and he walks into the room, and he doesn't notice the bed is empty, and it's made up, and it's empty, and, and, he, and he just, he says, he says, good news, Mrs. Bryan, I think we got it all. The patient is dead, and he's saying, I think we got it all. This is what the lawyer is saying. I think I got it all. I think I can keep the law. I think I'm sinless. I think I'm without sin. And Jesus is saying, you're DOA, man. You're dead on arrival. Just like everyone who is trusting in their own goodness, we can never, we can never get it all out. That's why Paul says in Galatians 3, for all who rely on the works of the law are already under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. If you want to be saved by keeping the law, you're cursed before you start because all you have to do is be perfect. Thankfully, there's good news, right? Thankfully, there's good news. This is why it's good news. That's why it's the greatest news ever heard. Paul gives the solution in Galatians 3.11. He says, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the just shall live by faith. It's the same old message. Believe in the Jesus who died to take your place, to forgive your sins if you will just come to him so that his righteousness can become yours. That's what Jesus is trying to teach this lawyer. He's not trying to put him down, but he's trying to elicit from him a confession. I see it now, Jesus. I see it. I, you're right. I can't do this. I can't do this. So I'm just going to cast myself on the mercy of God and trust that you are who you say you are and that you've come to somehow forgive my sins. He didn't know didn't have to know the details. The apostles didn't all know the details yet, but Paul explains it later that Christ was made by the Father to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That's the trade-off, my sin for His righteousness. It's the only way you can get it out. So this morning, 
you know, we, we're tempted to ask, well, did this guy come to faith in Christ? Did he find grace? We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us, right? But we know he got his chance. He met face to face with the Son of God who tried to bring him to that faith. And so this morning we have our chance as well. Jesus' teaching is just as relevant today as it was then. If you want to be saved by keeping the law, if you want to be saved by your goodness, all you got to do is be perfect in word, in deed, and in thought. That's all. We all know we can't do that. The only way you can do that is to try and somehow bring the law down, and God's not going to allow that. So what's left? Declare moral bankruptcy and cast yourself on the mercy of God who loves to forgive sinners who will humble themselves in his presence and say, yes, I need you. The top of grace is down, beloved, but you've got to jump in. Here's your story, Sarah. We used to camp tent trailer when the kids were younger. One year we had been exploring the glories of Yosemite for about a week, and then we crossed over Tuolumne Meadows to 395, went south till we came to Mammoth. And just up from Mammoth, we found a beautiful lake to camp out for a couple of days. And the first day we were there, we got out the fishing poles and we went down and... and uh, threw those in the water. They weren't great, but they were fishing poles. And Tim and Sarah were both at an age where they thought that looked like fun. And so the next morning, they could hardly wait to get back and run down to the, to the lake down there and throw their fishing poles in. And we said, just be careful, don't get wet. And about 45 minutes later, here they came traipsing back. Sarah in the lead, that was always a clue. <laughs> only, too health, only, only, only too anxious to let us know that Tim fell in the water. So Patty said, well, Tim, how, how, wet did you, how wet are you? And Tim says, oh, I'm just, I'm just a little wet. Of course, it didn't take long to examine him and find out he was wet from head to toe. He went all the way in. But forever after around our house, to say you were just a little wet meant you were in it up to your eyeballs. <laughs> up to your eyeballs. That's what the law is intended to do. It's not intended to save us. It can't. You can't keep the law. But the law is intended to do what Jesus used it to do here, which is to show us that we're in it up to our eyeballs with no possibility of escape. And then the gospel begins to look like what it really is, the good news that it really is. I must come to Jesus by faith. I must cast myself at the feet of the Savior who will forgive me if I will only ask. That's the only option, beloved. And that's what he's doing this morning, waiting for us to ask. If you've never done that, no better time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Lord, I thank you for how gentle you were with this man, even though he was testing you, trying to put you down. You were patient. You were exacting in your very precise in the way you showed him by his own actions and by his own words, his failure. I hope he came. I hope he came to know you. I hope he didn't think he could really go away and do likewise, because by that time he must have known it wasn't possible. But Lord, his fate is whatever it is now. The question is for us, where are we? Are we still holding out some kind of hope that we can earn our way into your favor? Lord, I pray if there's one, two, three, five, ten people here this morning that that's still at the back of their mind. They're better than their neighbor. They're, shoot, they're one of the best people they know. Surely they'll be there. They're better certainly than the Christians they know. And that may be true, but that's not the question. The question is, are they forgiven? Bring their heart to repentance, I pray. Ask that the work that only your Holy Spirit can do, you would do. 
And that as we, even as we sing this closing hymn, their heart would cry out to you. Lord, if there's some who are left with questions, help them to come and ask. How can I, I don't get what you're saying. How can I know this? I'd love to talk to them. But Lord, help us not to leave here not knowing whether we're right with you or not. We can know that now. We don't have to wait till later to find out if our good works outweighed our bad. We can know it now because we're forgiven. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.